Okay, next we have Peter Eisenman, who's making his way up. Thank you, Daniela. I, I think we made a mistake in this conference, which should have been Patrick presenting and then the four of us critiquing what he presented. I, I got more notes now. Um, I'm confused about what I want to say because uh, I was so much involved with Patrick. What's so interesting for me is I can agree to disagree about everything he says. And uh, that's quite a lot because there are not many people who I would share the pat platform with who I can <laughs> agree to disagree about anything. Um, I am going to make three perhaps laconic points. Um, I, I just want to start with a footnote to Stanley Tigerman um, and to say that uh, Stanley and I, um, well, it's not a footnote to Stanley, it's a footnote to me. Uh, Stanley and I are the only two living architects in the world who were at the first architectural biennale in 1976 in, Vien in, in Venice and are here at the Chicago Biennial. So I just thought uh, that would be an interesting point to, to start with. The three points that I want to make. Um, I started architecture in, I would argue, 1961 when I was traveling with Colin Rowe um, in Italy, or I had, was about to travel with Colin to Italy. We came across the border from between Switzerland and Italy and a town called Chiasso to Chernobyl. We came to Como where, uh, if I had images, which I probably should, but I'd rather speak without them. Um, uh, we came across the Casa del Fascio of, of uh, Giuseppe Taragni. And Colin likes to say that Peter had an epiphany at that moment seeing this building. And it's true that I had an epiphany, and it's true that I've been trying to work out for the past um, 54, 55 years what the hell that was. Uh, and I had already seen Le Corbusier at, at Weissenhof, I'd seen Mies van der Rohe, I'd seen Adolf Loos, Barons, Wright, everybody, but not, not one of them did what this particular building did for me. Um, and I have spent most of my professional life trying to understand what that was. Uh, and it's an, a, a very elusive uh, occupation. But it was part of why I went into teaching, part of why I did a doctorate dissertation at Cambridge, uh, was that moment of seeing this uh, building in Como. In the second day in Italy, that was the first day in Italy, in the second day, uh, Colin and I drove to a small town in the Veneto uh, called Montagnana, uh, where there was my first Palladian villa. And Colin uh, was a 90 degree day, 95 degrees, who knows, hot, dusty, etc. He said, I'm going to go sit in this uh, cafeteria, cafe, outdoor cafe, and have a beer. I want you to stand in front of that building and tell me, until you can tell me something that's about the building that's not there. And I thought, what's he talking about? Something that's not there. Uh, and uh, it was my second lesson in architecture, uh, to learn uh, that architecture is un unfortunately metaphysical, that it deals with things which are not there. And if I were having a critique with Patrick, it would be 
all of the th wonderful things that he has to show us are there. And the things that I'm interested in are the things that are not there. Uh, and there's a huge gap in between. And I've been, again, working on that gap uh, for some now 35 years. I've just published my book on uh, Palladio uh, called Palladio Virtuel, Virtual Palladio, i.e. what isn't uh, physical. And <clears throat> so these two uh, experiences, Palladio on the one hand and Tarani on the other, have made a, a search for me in, in the ensuing uh, 40 years. Uh, I never know what to call that. Uh, and I never know what that means, uh, especially when people tell me about uh, sustainability and lead certificates and technology, et cetera. And I think to myself, gee, uh, Palladio certainly get a lead certificate in the sustainability. Uh, I wonder what the problem is. And one of my best friend colleagues who is an, an expert in sustainability said to me, sustainability has no determinant in form and space. Now, if you write that deeply into your brain, you'll begin to realize that if you're studying sustainability in a design studio, you're in the wrong place. Uh, I will not comment on Patrick's comment on the uh, Biennale, since I haven't seen it. But uh, I was reading my latest issue of the New York Review of Books. Um, unfortunately, it's called the New York Review of Books. And I was reading it about a book, uh, a review of a book that I was uh, myself reading, Purity by Jonathan Franzen. Uh, Jonathan being one of my favorite authors. Um, I'm, I, I can't quite tell you whether it's good or bad, but what attracted me was that it was written by a woman, Diane John Johnson, former uh, faculty member at Harvard and a very interesting theoretical uh, person in linguistics, in post-structural linguistics. And in the second paragraph, uh, of her review, she says, in one of his essays, i.e. Jonathan Franzen's, called Mr. Difficult, Franzen distinguishes between one kind of novel, a status, in quotes, a status novel, like those written by Flaubert, Proust, Kafka, and especially William Gaddis, that invite a discourse of genius and, uh, and, and art historical importance. And the kind of novel that he likes to read, this is the other kind, and believes in, the contract novel, referring to the contract between writer and reader, who both expect novels to be enjoyed, to be inspiring as well. Purity, the novel that she's writing about, says, she says, makes a stab at having status qualities uh, in its complicated chronology and ambitious array of moral concerns, but in its page-turning sequence of events and hot sex scenes, it also tries to fulfill the contract. And I began to think, that's pretty much one of the issues that uh, for me is important, the difference between a contract novel and a status novel. She concludes this uh, review by saying, as a novel, that is purity, about inauthenticity and intense self-consciousness and as a portrait of the modern world, it's convincing enough for me, Franzen, from whom so much is expected, seems on a sort of literary mountaintop with several paths down. 
the, the one he came up just now, mind with the melodrama and misstep, or there's the other path down where the status flag planted a little higher up on the slope if he is the energy for climbing with his already heavy backpack of contract books. And if he takes some time to contemplate the view before getting back to work. Now that to me divides the world into uh, contracts and status if you want. I divide it in another more appropriate, let's say to this audience and uh, this conference between star architects and heroes. And my argument would be that star architects are contract architects. They give people what they want. They try and make society better. They're great reading. They make great images, as we have seen, uh, et cetera. Uh, but they, do they aspire to that status of the problematic, let's say? And um, what I would argue is that schools, especially in the United States from the early 20th century to the present, were dominated by uh, conditions of the disciplinary authority. In the 1900s through to about 1920, uh, the disciplinary authority was the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. All the teachers were Beaux-Arts trained, uh, and that's what you could study. Uh, modern architecture was problematic, not, and even though colleges like MIT and, and Harvard started to build modern buildings, modern architecture wasn't taught. So that the only modern architect that we could remember and have in the United States was Frank Lloyd Wright. So in 1950, when I started school, uh, the only modern architect, the authority, was Frank Lloyd Wright. He was a consummate hero. Uh, he was the uh, Ian Watt Rand uh, fountainhead heroic version of, of the architect. We all had on our desks in the nature of materials, we all knew the right books, we knew the buildings, uh, and it was the authority that broke away from the Beaux-Arts authority. In the, in the 60s, we moved from Wright to Louis Kahn, and Lou Kahn became the new authority, and whether it was uh, the, the Trenton Bathhouses, the Richards Medical Center, any number of uh, the library at Exeter, uh, Khan was the uh, architect of authority, and we looked to Khan uh, not as a star, but as a hero. In the late 60s, uh, when Bob Venturi's book, Complexity and Contradiction, came out, fo followed by Learning from Las Vegas, Bob Venturi became uh, uh, another American hero. Uh, along with, let's say, Le Corbusier, uh, Mies van der Rohe, et cetera. I can remember teaching in the, in the middle 60s before the student riots, uh, 65, 66. Every student had the Herve Complet on their desk of Le Corbusier. There were references. We spoke a common language. There was an authority. After Venturi's complexity and contradiction and uh, learning from Las Vegas, there were other authority figures, uh, Jim Sterling, Aldo Rossi, uh, people like this. Uh, in the next generation, in the late 70s, early 80s, we had in 1980 a moment of transcendence when uh, Paolo Portoghese in the second architectural biennale had the Strada Novissima, uh, which celebrated a whole raft of new ideas and, and new architects. 
And uh, at that moment, um, we had another hero, uh, which was Michael Graves of the uh, New York Five. And I say Michael Graves because <clears throat> he was a longtime friend, uh, was a hero for me as a teacher, as a friend, as an architect. I would argue that the difference between Patrick and myself is not really one of substance uh, because the answer uh, to the question that Daniela proposed uh, would uh, neither be yes nor no. Yes or no as a fixed answer would be wrong. Uh, and of course, uh, I would argue that uh, Patrick uh, rejection of pluralism, he says, we also must reject the rejection. And that's where we would get into a really interesting argument about a meta dialectic, let's say, one that transcends the dialectic. In conclusion, um, because I'm almost at my 20 minutes, um, I want to say that for students, for architects, et cetera, because of media, uh, because of Instagram and Facebook and all these things, we suffer daily things that we only could see once a month uh, when there were magazines. Uh, we now have every, every day I've got a new Frank Gehry building, a new Wolf Pricks building, a new Zaha Hadid building, a new Norman Foster building. Every day, uh, I have to be up on these things. And I would argue that these people, all of us, when I say these, us who are here, are trapped in this culture of stars. Uh, the media has needs a new star every day etc. And I would argue in conclusion, uh, perhaps Patrick and I would agree, we got too many stars and not enough heroes. Thank you very much.